instruct his followers, us, the parables. And today we've got three parables, so I need you to bear with me as I read through all three of them, but it's important to understand that these three parables come together. So listen for God's word for you and for this community from Luke 15. Now, all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling, saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or... What woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So the father divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country, and he began to be in need. So he went, and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to the field to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare, but here I am dying of hunger? I will get up and go to my father, and I will say, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he sent off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his eldest son was in the field. And we came and approached the house. He heard the music and the dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked, what is going on? And he replied, your brother has come back and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then this older brother became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who, was devour who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we come before your text today, your word, with questions, so many questions, about who you are, what you would do, and what you would have us do. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to you as we continue to hold out these questions before you. Amen. Okay. I, um, I don't know how about all of you, but there is a big debate going on in the social media world between millennials and Gen Zers. And I'm sorry if you are not familiar with this debate, but I'm going to speak to that a little bit here for just a second. I'm going to firmly put myself here in the millennial camp today, not just because I refuse to give up my side part, but because one of my favorite movies is the movie Mean Girls. And I see in that movie, Mean Girls, so many important lessons for our life today, so many important lessons that connect to this story. In that movie, there is a tactic that some of the popular girls would use when they wanted Katie, the main character, to get her attention. They would walk past her and loudly have a conversation about her. Today's text opens up with the religious folks of Jesus' day doing just that, behaving like these millennial mean girls. It is as if they are all huddled in a group and walk past Jesus, sitting with his friends at lunch and say, Psh, have you met that guy Jesus? He's fetch, but he welcomes sinners and eats with them. Like the mean girls in the movie, they announce just loudly enough their disapproval. There's another scene in that movie when the popular girls stop at Katie's table, the main character's table, and just outright ask why she is sitting with a bunch of weirdos. Similarly, it is as if today's religious leaders in the story are asking, uh, Jesus? Why would you hang out with sinners and tax collectors, outcasts? Behind every snarky side comment or accusatory question of a mean girl is almost always something deeper. To understand what that might be, you usually have to understand the relationship between the mean girls and the weirdos, between the sinners, the outcasts, and the religious leaders. To the religious people of Jesus' day, outcasts and sinners were not simply those who denied the law. Rather, they were probably one of two things. First, they were those who were denied by those who kept the law, cast out by those who kept the law. For example, tax collectors. Tax collectors were those who chose to work for Rome, which was at odds with the religious establishment, and so they were seen in many ways as religious traitors who, while not necessarily breaking the religious law, broke the unspoken code, broke with tradition. And so they are cast out, outcasts of their community. Second group are those sinners. Those sinners weren't necessarily kicked out or outcasts, but scholar Amy Jill Levine explains that they were welcome in the religious communities only on the condition of repentance. She then goes on to explain that the Gospels generally present sinners as wealthy people who have not attended to the poor, and that they were probably both actively and passively judged for their behavior by the religious elite. So whether they were officially cast out by the religious establishment or they didn't feel welcome because they felt judged, the people Jesus was sitting at the table with are individuals who at one point or another had friendships or relationships with those religious leaders. 
There's folks making the snarky side comments. But who, for one reason or another, were driven out by those leaders and were made to feel unwelcome. In other words, the people sitting at the table with Jesus were the people that those religious leaders had lost. Ever aware of unspoken dynamics, the backstory of the mean girls and the weirdos of religious leaders and sinners, Jesus responds to those religious leaders' snarky side comment by telling three stories in the presence of those leaders and those they lost. The story of the lost sheep, the story of the lost coin, and the story of the lost sons. Now, like we do with most parables, we typically allegorize the main character in all these stories to be Jesus. And that works, and that's beautiful. But that's not initially what Jesus is up to here, right at the beginning. You'll notice that all the main characters in these parables were actually quite complicit in the losing process. Much like the religious folk are complicit in losing the sinners at Jesus' table. The shepherd lost his sheep. How do you lose sheep? You stop paying attention to the herd. The woman lost a coin. How do you lose a coin? You spend too much time counting your money. The father lost his sons. How do you lose your sons? Wouldn't be, I wouldn't be surprised if at least a few of the religious leaders Jesus was responding to knew what it meant to not just lose their religious followers, but also to lose touch with a child. A child who might have been sitting right there with Jesus. So I think this could have been personal for these religious leaders. And, and Jesus makes it personal. He literally starts these stories off by saying, which one of you, yes, you, you religious leaders, having a hundred sheep, Jesus is inviting them to find their place in this story, and then Jesus plays to their better angels, or at least their desire to be the hero, as he outlines for them what they would do if they lost a sheep, a coin, or a son. So Jesus is definitely answering the what would Jesus do question, but more than that, he is answering the what would Jesus have you do question for these religious leaders. Which of you, having 100 sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? Or what woman, having 10 silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? When faced with an outcast or a sinner or a lost loved one, Jesus, not so subtle, implication to the religious folk, folks is to not debate whether they're worth it or not, or grumble, but to drop everything and search for them. Now, on some level, this is dumb. Shepherd leaving 99 sheep to go search for one leaves an entire herd vulnerable to predators. And yet Jesus makes it clear in this story that as long as the one is lost, the 99 are not complete. As long as the coin is missing, the treasure is not whole. As long as either one of the sons is missing, the household, the family is broken. Luke Scholar and friend of this congregation, Eric Barreto, writes, as long as one of our siblings is broken by the world, cast aside as irrelevant, called a sinner by the rest of us, then we are at a loss. And God's heart is broken. God will never stop reaching for the one because God's love is too wide. God's grace is too rich to seek, to cease looking for the lost, for those we deem unredeemable. On top of that, I have to imagine that the process that Jesus is suggesting to these religious leaders of searching is not easy. A shepherd to search for a lost sheep would have to scurry over rocks and down gullies, 
A woman searching her floor would probably come out of this with dirty hands and tired knees, and who hasn't hit their head in the process of trying to search for something on the floor? The search is not easy. It is not intended to be easy. It requires the shepherd and the woman to put their bodies on the line to deal with their own anxieties and fears and limits. This is also true when we are searching for and caring for a person. That we, as religious folks, or as anyone really, have lost. Sure, maybe we are not going to traverse the physical distance to find someone, but spiritual searching for someone does require going with the lost, toward the lost, and requires going to the emotional mountaintops and through the valleys of the shadow of death. It requires fending off their demons and your demons, their wolves and your wolves, be it anxiety or self-doubt or fear. Emotional and spiritual work of searching can leave you scratched up. And I think we see this most acutely in the story of the lost sons. You will note that I've been calling it the story of the lost sons because we find out at the end that both sons are lost over the course of Jesus' story. The youngest one goes off and gets lost in wild living. The oldest son then gets lost in that way that oldest children, like me, are best at. We get lost in our feelings of that double-sided coin of self-righteousness and insufficiency. When the father goes out to the field to be with his older son, when the father goes on this emotional journey, goes emotionally searching, spiritually searching for his son, he goes to the, his son's valley of the shadow of death. He dug into his son's feelings of jealousy and self-righteousness, that feeling of never being enough. And I am sure it was hard and difficult for both the oldest son to reveal this to the father and for the father to hear this from his son, that his son really didn't feel loved by him. So we search for the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost child of God, inside the lost who are around us and among us. What quickly becomes evident is that time and time again, one of the things they need is a shoulder. Jesus, in the parable of the lost sheep, describes the shepherd lifting up the lost sheep onto his shoulder and carrying them back. As we, as we religious folks, consider what Jesus is calling us to do here in these lost stories, as we seek out the lost children, maybe we can't offer putting the lost in our life on our shoulders. Or maybe you are a little lost and weary yourself in this process. So that's not what you can offer, but the work, the work is to take a step, to, an, to attempt to at least start by maybe offering a shoulder to cry on. And then the work is to trust that the same shoulders that carry you and your sin, me and my sin, all the way to Calvary have already carried the lost sheep, the lost son, this child, to safety. Following in the footsteps of Jesus, hearing this call he gives to the religious folk of his day in the presence of the lost, we realize that searching out the lost, searching out the scared, searching out anyone who feels judged is important because being pursued like this, being searched for with a wild and relentless fervor in a way that seems pretty foolish, reinforces the promise that Jesus proclaims. The promise Jesus proclaims with his life as well as with his death and resurrection, that before repentance, but that before coming back to the Father, like the youngest lost son, the lost, 
The lost can always be found in the heart of God. Let those who have ears hear the parables of the lost things and find themselves found. Amen.